our capacity to receive what you're giving. We ask this in Jesus' name. Praise God. Beautiful. Thank you, Paul. Standing on holy ground, we know in Christ the holy ground is here. Tap yourself on the arm and say, this is holy ground. Praise the Lord. There's angels all around. Angelos messengers. Well, I'm looking at the whole kind of messengers sitting here. So I'm surrounded by angels. Praise the Lord. So I just want to ask Bertie to come forward. We're going to pray with you. Praise God. And uh, Maybe Paul, you put on the digital recorder, but I forgot to put on that just to record this too. Praise God. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Father, just thank you. Thank you for your joy and your delight in your son. I just thank you, Lord, that joy which is manifest in everything he says today because it's our strength to hear your voice. And we just thank you, Lord Jesus, that it's a beautiful thing. It's a precious thing. And we just acknowledge your voice in this man in this place tonight in Jesus' name. Where is God? Amen. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. It's an absolute honor for me to be here and to minister the gospel of grace. Philem, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for allowing me to come and minister to your people. Tonight, I would like to talk to you a little bit about promise. God's promise to us. And, uh, you know, we've so many times thought of the promises of God and claiming the promises of God and walking in the promises of God. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight as pertaining to the original promise that God had for all of us and how everything that has been created and everything that has been made Everything that you can see, the universe, everything that there is that exists has been created by this promise. Or, one can use these words, having this beautiful promise in mind. So, um, yeah, let me just pray before we go into, go into the message. Father, I want to thank you that I can just agree with the worship here with Philem, his prayer. And I also just want to come and say, Father, I am available for you to speak through me today. And I acknowledge that the people that sit here in front of me is your church. Holy, the bride of the Christ, the wife of Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that I can come with in all respect and speak to heard your words of truth and thank you that you guide me and inspire me to speak in such a way that we will just find an increase of knowledge which is experiential from you and that everybody will go away here saying thank you Lord for teaching me thank you Lord for washing me thank you Lord for showing who you are to me and sharing your life with me. Amen. 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 Right, I want to start out by saying, you know, when Jesus Christ was born, uh, the angels came and said, you know, you shall call his name Jesus. Why will you call his name Jesus? For he shall save his people from their sins. So, Getting rid of sin is not a matter of you repenting from your sin. It is a matter of Jesus saving you from your sin. We can so many times, I mean, if repentance from sin was the way where you could get free from sin, there would be no need for Jesus to save you from your sin. Just think a bit about that. If you could, uh, let's say you think of bitterness, for instance. If you could get yourself free from bitterness by repenting from being bitter, uh, why would Jesus be needed in order to save you from your sin? You can just repent from your sin. You know? uh, so, even as we discussed last night, 
repentance is not so much, it doesn't have so much to do with you trying to stop your sins. Repentance has got a lot to do with acknowledgement on who is the ruler of the world mm -hmm. and under whose authority you stand. And as you then stand and uh, are impacted by the rule and the authority of the Christ, the rule of the Christ is to set you free from the burden that you were trying to carry to bring life into your life. Now, that is a lot of words. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of concepts that I've just mentioned there. I mean, one can unpack that in a week, uh, which we're going to start right now. So, uh, don't worry about food and those kind of things. You'll have some food, and that will be to eat, the, uh, to, to eat from the will of the Father. So, don't worry about eating through the night and all that. We will, we will do the things the way Paul did it. We'll preach through the night, and then in the morning, uh, you'll pray for me, and I'll get in the car. And I'll be on my way to the next place to preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, <laughs> one day, well, rest. He'll save you. Amen. Right, so um, I think just at the beginning, I want you to know, and I want, want you to enter the atmosphere of knowing that saving from sin is Jesus' work. So if God brought Jesus to save us from our sins, whose responsibility is it that you are sinless? It's God's. It's His responsibility. We find it even echoed in Ephesians where it says that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the body who's come to wash us with the washing of the Word so that He can present us holy and blameless to Himself. Stuff. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, yeah. So when you come to Jesus, you come to the one that will wash you with a word. So the washing and the saving is he's going to save you by his word. He's going to save you by what he says about you. He's going to save you by his message that he had from time and eternity. Now, if we look at the word... Of God, and that's what we're going to talk about, uh, we need to define what the Word is. And I'm going to say to you that the Word, and what we're talking about tonight, is the Word of Promise. Now, to define Word of Promise, we first going to start with promise. What is a promise? Now, if we go look in the Latin, the word promise reflects an action of sending forth one's intentions or assuring someone that a certain action will be taken or a condition will be fulfilled. So the Latin feeling that you would get when you would understand the word promise is that it is basically sending someone to make sure and to bring certainty that a certain action will be taken. That is a promise. So if you promise someone the Latin form of it is, I'm sending someone so that that person will then assure you that a certain action shall be taken. Keep that in the back of your mind. In the English, we simply look at a commitment to perform a specific act. So if you say you promise, then you say, well, I commit myself that I will perform a certain act. In the Latin, it has got more to do with sending someone to persuade you that you will keep your commitment. So there's another person kind of involved when a promise is made. In the Hebrew sense, if you look at the etymology of the word, the, the, the modern Hebrew word for promise, it basically uh, says that it reflects or basically uh, derives from a root word meaning to trust or to feel secure. So a promise is bringing trust or the feeling of being secure to the one unto whom the promise is made. So the Latin sense is, well, someone is sent to persuade you. In the normal English sense, it's, well, a commitment to do what you say you're going to do. And the Hebrew sense, uh, a promise is basically, the feeling around the promise is a sense of security in the one 
Or a promise is that which is said or done towards someone that will bring his heart to a place of rest. And it is experienced then by the word shalom, which is peace. And a Greek meaning is simply to bind yourself by a contract. So a promise is therefore that which is provided by the promise maker, producing safety, security, and peace in the one that is promised. And that's very important. So if God promises, the reason why He promises you is so that you can rest. Mm. Yes. That's why He promises God doesn't promise us to see as if we will believe Him so that we can qualify for the promise. Yeah. Yeah. Once God promised, you've already qualified. Okay? So if you promise your, your son a car, the idea is that he would not be worried Imagine a child you, in South Africa, in America, I think at 16 you can drive. In South Africa it's 80. So imagine you see your child worried about if he will be able to drive when he's 18. And you want to save him from the worry. How would you save him from the worry? You promise him a car. That is how you'll save him. And then if he can behold your integrity that you've had over the years, that integrity combined with the promise will then save him from anxiety. So you're not going to tell your son, listen, I'm, let me tell you something about a car. I see you very anxious about the car. So if you can stop to be anxious about a car, I promise you a car. <laughs> You see, it's the wrong way around. God is a Savior. He's the one that wants to bring peace to us. So, what He will do if He makes a promise is, He will promise and then He will send assurance, someone that can assure us of His promise. And the idea is that we would then enter into Shalom. Now, if we, if we use this the definition of a promise as the foundation from where we define certain biblical terms and we want to define righteousness in the light of the promise, we would then say that righteousness would be <coughs> in connection with the promise would be that the promise maker keep his promise. So, if you think of the righteousness of God, it is God keeping His promise. Amen? Yes. It's God keeping His promise. It would be unrighteous for God not to keep His promise. And it would be right, if righteousness means to act correctly, it would be right for us to rest in His promise, on account of the great integrity that God has. Yes. Amen. Yeah. So righteousness is defined in God keeping His promise, and we simply say, God is faithful, He will keep His promise. Yeah. That's how we walk in righteousness. We've defined righteousness in a completely different way. Righteousness is born from the faithfulness of God. Even the word trust in the Bible, which is a synonym for the word to believe. The word believe and the word trust is synonym and it means this, to have your mind at rest in the integrity of another. So when you trust is when your mind that always says, yes, but what if? When your mind cannot anymore say, yes, but what if? Because all the what ifs that you have is answered in the faithfulness of God. So the only way you can come to a place of belief and trust is for God to portray His faithfulness in such a tangible 
and clear way that all our what ifs are answered to the point that our anxious mind go to rest and is intended. Mm -hmm. yes. So, if we want that rest, we need to say, God, what word do you have for me? How do you promise me? What do you send for? What do you send before the fulfillment of this promise? Or what, what proof are you giving me? What sign are you giving me that I, that my mind can go to rest? What will you show me that I can enter shalom as pertaining to the promise you've made? And that is what we basically going to go into when we talk about this promise. Now, just to make it clear in a practical way. Why do you promise your child? I mean, there, there are different reasons, but we're going to look at, at, at one or two. When you drop your child off at school and he's young, and you promise him, I'll pick you up at school. I don't know if we hear a bus pick the kids up, or people pick the kids up, but where we are, where we are, the young lad needs to walk home. We're not picking him up. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> We pick him up at school and we tell him, we will pick you up at school. Why? Number one, we want him to be at peace. We want him to have rest. You want him at school to focus on the schoolwork. Because if he doesn't know if you're going to pick him up, he can't do his work. It will actually enable him to have his full potential. Because he's not worried about how he's going to get something. You know, in Christianity, we've had this worry. You know, how am I going to get to heaven? Will I ever be saved? You know, we had so many worries. And now we are actually now supposed to learn about the goodness of God. But we are always worried. You know, we, we're not really focusing on the work. Because we're so worried on how we're going to get home one day. We promise our children, we'll pick you up. I'll pick you up and I'll take you home. So that, number one, you will have peace. And number two, that he will not, especially if you live in a big city with freeways and all those kind of things, that he would see no need to engage his own ability to walk home. Yeah. Yeah. Because if he engages his own ability, he's going to kill himself. Mm -hmm. He can have himself killed, raped. If you live in a, in a dangerous country, he can be kidnapped. You don't want that. So you want to save him from self-harm, basically. You want to save him from a dangerous situation by promising him. The promise is designed to keep him safe. To basically save him from himself, to a certain degree. Because once that young kid starts to cross freeways and stuff, walk through dangerous areas, he's in trouble. So the promise is designed to keep you out of works. Yes. If you understand what yes. I'm saying. That's why it's my promise. So, when we now look at the promise, we'll find a very powerful, powerful explanation of that. And that is in John chapter 1. Now, I'm going to read two verses and we're going to look at the meaning of this promise. It says in John 1 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. This was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him, this is this Word, was life. And the life was the light of men. Sadly, we so many times when we think of the word Word in John chapter 1 or the Word of God. We are thinking of the Bible. Now, when the Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, it doesn't mean that God had a Bible on His bedside table. In the beginning. It does not refer to the book that we are reading when it's talking about the Word. It's talking about something else. We would then say the Word refers to Jesus. So, and then we would think of the second person 
in the Godhead, and we would think of in the beginning was the Word, and we would think of a man seated next to God. Now, I don't think that that is what John tried to communicate. Now, when we think of Jesus, I'm not saying anything about the Trinity at all. What I'm talking about is, and I want you to, to get what John was saying when he used the word logos. He used the word word, a message, something said, the logos or the, even if you want to say the logic, it's not actually correct, of God. It was in the beginning. So it says in the beginning was a word. That word was with God. And that word is God. And then it refers later on to Jesus the person. Now with that in mind, I want to just say, make, get yourself ready not to think of that word just as the Bible. And you will find that I preach from the Bible, I absolutely believe in the Bible. You know, the Bible contains the word of God in every verse, in every word that is spoken there. Now, with that in mind, we go to 1 John chapter 1. We find John writing it in a little bit different words, and we see what that word was. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. So he's saying, in the beginning was something that we heard. So from the beginning, in the beginning was something, and we heard it. Now what do you hear? You hear a word. So in the beginning, there was a word that we heard. Or the word that God had was from the beginning. That which we have now seen with our eyes, that which we beheld, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So what he's saying is, is in the beginning was the word of life. In the beginning was the word. What was this word? John now elaborates a little bit on this. It was a word of life from the beginning. Let's go to Titus chapter 1 verse 2. Paul says, I am an apostle, I mean the hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now, let's link it. In the beginning was God's word. Okay, what was this word? It was a word of life. Paul uses that same word as the word of life, saying, in the beginning, God promised eternal life. So the word that was from the beginning was God's promise to humanity that He will give all of us eternal life. That's His promise. So when God made everything, He made it with that in mind. So He made the heavens and the earth. Why? Because He wants to give man eternal life. Then he created a garden and he created man and he created the tree of life. For what reason? Because what does he have in mind? I want I promise my people eternal life. That's what I want. The Almighty God was in, I wouldn't even say in heaven because he created the heaven and the earth. The heavens of heavens cannot even contain him. He was in his fullness of existence and said, well, the life that I have, the the being as pertaining to eternal life that only I possess, I want to share it with someone. I want someone else to basically feel what it feels like to share in my life. And you will know that is also, I believe, the correct reason why you have children. Now, you don't have children for the purpose of washing the dishes. I mean, they can and they should wash the dishes, but that's not why you have them. And if you had them for that reason, don't tell them. <laughs> Unless you, you want the rebel in the home. So, the reason why God had us, we can see from the beginning, was a word of promise. And in the beginning was this word, and everything that was made, was made by it. It would be equivalent for me saying, well, you know, I want to give my son, I, 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 I one day want a son that has a successful business. Then I might say, okay, in order to get that, what do I need? Well, I'm going to need a wife. And then she will have to be pregnant, 
a son will have to be born. But in order for him to have that business, I'll have to bring other things into creation. I will then have to buy maybe a plot or a piece of land. I will start a business. And then I will also need a good university for him. If there is not one and I'm very wealthy, then I will have a university built. And everything that will be created will be created by that word that I have. That I will have a son that is a successful businessman. I, don't, I hope you understand what it means that everything was created by the word of promise. Everything God made. If you see a tree, you can say, well, this tree and whatever we see exists because God wanted to create a place where His people can live forever sharing in His life. Knowing what it feels like to love, knowing what it feels like to be kind, knowing what it feels like to have intimacy, knowing what it feels like to share in the life of the Almighty God. I hope you can see that the project that God had in mind is completely out of reach for humans by their own ability. Yeah. It's too high. It's too lofty. Yeah. It is... It, it is basically God saying, I promise you eternal life. Now, if God promised man eternal life, we're going to define what that is. We're going to see if God can keep his promise. But if we look at that word of eternal life, and we say, well, God wants to give us this eternal life. And if God wanted to make sure that it will only be by him keeping his promise, the best way for God to, and the best form where he could define man was to make him of something that cannot produce it by itself. So he said, let me make man then from dust. So that everything he will be, all the beautiful life that will be in him, will only come from him. So he said, okay, I'm going to form man from the dust of the earth, meaning man will have no ability in himself to attain unto that life. And God made sure that he said that to man from the beginning. The word Adam is a derivative from the word Adama, which means earth. So in Hebrew, if you would say it to somebody, he basically said to Adam when he called him, he said, earthy. <laughs> Earthy. And Paul echoes that in 1 Corinthians 15. He said the first man, Adam, was of the earth, earthy. So the first man never had the ability to by himself ever attain unto the life of God. God provided him a tree of life to eat from. And God would give him that eternal life. And the worst thing that could ever happen to that man is for him to die. Would be to die. He doesn't want him to die. So God came and said, in Adam, I want to tell you, in your own ability, you can never attain unto eternal life. In your own ability, your, your nature is weak unto eternal life. It would be equivalent for me to say to my son, while I'm building him an aeroplane, Wherewith he can fly when he's 18 years old to tell him, Son, I know inside your heart is, and I've designed you that way, is a desire for flight. You want to fly. But I tell you now, <laughs> please, you are not the bird. I am making a way for you to fly. But now, while you are growing up, know this. This flight is only by my ability. Don't go and stand on a cliff and try to fly. Because I've got a dream for you. And I don't want you to die before that. But I want to tell you that's the story of Genesis 1. It's not a story of a God that decided to test a man to have two trees to see which one he's going to eat from. And if he eats of the wrong one, then God is going to kill him. No. It's a story of God bringing forth a person where he's young and growing, where he's a father and he's creating a home for him, he's creating a life for him. And 
and, and he is giving, giving him a mind, a will, an intellect, so that he can relate to him and walk with him. And Adam, what man did was, he ate of the wrong tree, I'm not going to go into detail on what all of that means, and the worst happened. Adam died. And when he ate of the poison, the day he ate thereof, his death was certain. And we find God basically walking through the, in the garden. And in scripture, we kind of get this feeling of an anxiety. Not that God can be anxious about anything, but you get this feeling of an anxiety. Adam, where are you? It's like your child that's lost. I remember years ago we were talking about in the car, I used this example, imagine you are in a shopping mall, big shopping mall in London with your child and he is four years old and all of a sudden you, you don't know where he is. How do you feel the moment you see he's not here? You feel, oh my goodness, where's this boy? Ah, oh, he's at the toys department, I know he's there. And then you walk there kind of fast. You, you, you're not running, but you walk fast. And then when you see he's not there, how do you feel then? Not so good. And if you see that well, and, and you go up and down the aisles, you don't find him, you finally start to run. If his name is Adam, you would say, Adam, where are you? Why would you have that kind of an anxiety inside your heart? It's because you don't want your child to die. Because you've got a dream of a beautiful life for your child. Isn't it? And you at least want that child to have the length of days that you have. If you have 80 years for yourself, you wish at least 80 years for your child. Isn't it? Yeah. Now if you are God and you know you're going to live forever, how many days do you want for your child? You want him to live forever, isn't it? Yes. We don't want him to die. Death is an enemy. And if your son dies, it's problematic. What puts you between you and your son? Death. So if you want your son back, what do you have to do? You have to conquer yeah. death. Death of what? Death of the human. Death of the body. You have to conquer death. Where? In the earth. <laughs> because that's where you've made yourself. That's where God made us. He's put us in the earth. Why did He put us in the earth? For to have a place where He can also put on a, a, a flesh and dwell amongst us then we can see Him, feel Him, touch Him, see who He is. Walk with Him. Because He loves us. And His desire to have a family to share His life with. Praise God. Amen. And then we found a murderer coming and murder his son. So man is kind of in the category of a victim. And we just see ourselves as guilty. You know, Adam kind of sinned and he, now he's guilty and now the guilt comes to the bloodlines and all of us are born with this guilt. Oh, I've got sinful flesh. Do you know that Jesus wants to save your flesh? Do you know that He loves your body? Do you know that the whole message about the cross and the burial and the resurrection has, and the birth of Jesus is all about the human body? Do you know that that is all about preserving the human body? Do you know that Paul went and preached the resurrection of what? Of the body. To preserve the body forever. Because when you were born, you know, and he saw you. I don't even want to say when he saw your body. When he saw you, he said, this, this baby, I want him or her to grow up. And then the personality that will come forth from this person 
and who this person is, spirit, soul, and body, is so beautiful to me that I want to preserve their life forever. I want them forever. That's what he wants. So, he promised man in the beginning eternal life. Now, the Jews didn't know exactly what this eternal life looked like. You need to understand that the Jews just had this kind of a concept of eternal life. You know, what is it? But God came and made it clear what this promise that was from the beginning truly was. That word that God had was, I can bring forth a man that is born of a woman whom I will father and that human being will literally, physically live forever. Now, it was very difficult to believe. Yeah, I mean, how do you believe it? I think that here's where the Latin way of looking at the whole thing comes in. God promises that to us. But now, He sent someone before our resurrection so that we can trust and rest in Him. And that man is Jesus. And He showed us what He promised from the beginning. What it looks like. In the beginning was God's word of promise. What did God give us in the beginning? God said, I give you my word. Isn't that what we say to somebody if you want him to believe us? I give you my word. My honor is at stake here. I give you my word. And what was the word that God gave? God's word was, I promise you eternal life. This eternal life was with God. The, that means the only one, I would say it's one of the interpretations of this, but the only one that possessed it. If you would ask, where is eternal life? You will say it's with God. That word, that promise of eternal life was only with God. And that promise was God Himself. He promised us Himself. Then He said to Abraham, Abraham, Genesis 15, when Abraham started stressing about money, He says, Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. Praise the Lord. Isn't it? The reward of your mind at rest is my life in you. Isn't it? What is the whole story about Abraham? Abraham and Sarah cannot have a child. Then God, out of dust, brought forth the child, Isaac, and promised eternal life, which says, in you all the nations forever shall be blessed. It's just the same message as in Genesis. Very same message. Isn't that beautiful? So He promises us this eternal life. How does this eternal life look? God, what do you mean by eternal life? It's very simple. A man born from a woman whom God then rebirths. So first, this man was born from a woman. Now this body is going to be born from the grave. And he was raised from the dead bodily. Jesus. And his body was now not just born from Mary, but his body now owes his birth to the Father. Which means that the physical body of Jesus from the resurrection has the attributes of the undying God in physical flesh. He promises us that. But you know you cannot attain unto that by your works. You cannot bake enough cakes in loving your neighbor to get your body never to die. It's impossible. You cannot give enough tithing or enough money to the church or to projects to the point that you'll attain unto eternal life. No. Once your body, the fullness of you, can see that Jesus is God's message to us and Jesus is the proof of God's promise and that God can keep it, 
He had, we now see that God promised and he sent someone before the fulfill, full fulfillment of the promise to prove to everybody that this is what he can do. And what Jesus did on the cross, he went into the death of us all because all of us would say, oh, my life is cursed somewhere. So Jesus says, okay, God says, okay, I will enter and I might, I'll put my promise on display in this inside the deepest darkness of all of humanity. And he will, I will take a man that is at a place where he unjustly died because we so many times say, oh, this is unjust or that is unjust. Oh, you know what they did to me? Do you know what they did? That to me, you know, if I look at South, South Africa, with the way it works there now is, well, it first was this, the black people were oppressed. And now, black people say, well, because we were oppressed, that's why we struggle. Look what they've done to me. It's unjust. Now, the white people say, well, we are being oppressed because now the black people get all the jobs and we don't get it. We are oppressed. It's unjust. Oh God, look how unjust it is. And then we have our eyes on the government to change our situation so that we can start to live. And all of a sudden the government becomes our savior. And that's why we can be so obsessed with the government. Because we've made them our savior. Now God says, let me show you what I can do if injustice prevails unto your death. Yes, praise God. <laughs> if you die under the oppressor, what then? There was Jesus. It's not just that he hangs there. It's not just that he dies. It is not just that the enemy has come, tempted Adam and Eve and murdered them. But what can God do with injustice? Jesus dies. The worst happened. But what does God say? I want to show you my promise that from the dust I can create a man, a physical man that was born from a physical woman. I can restore that body that was born out of that woman's womb that was drinking from her breasts. I can raise him from the dead never to die, to ever live in this earth. That's God's word. That is what God has always been saying. That's the word that was from the beginning. That is the word that created the Garden of Eden to bring that message. That is the word that led the Israelites out of Egypt to bring the message. You see the oppressor for 400 and something years? You see that injustice? I can lead you out. When God led them out, gave them everything, gave them manna and whatever, what happened? They didn't see that it was a kind of a stubbornness instead of now saying, well, look at the proof that God is bringing and allowing the proof to get, take your heart to rest. They, they, they refuse to have their hearts come to rest by the proof of God. And what proof has God given us that He can make what He promised in the beginning true? He brought that word into fulfillment. And let's read it again. I think with this we can read 1 John 1 with a new and fresh understanding. That which was from the beginning which we heard. That which we have seen with our eyes. That which we beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of life. The Berean Bible says that is the word of life. And the life was manifest, and we've seen it, and we bear witness, and declare unto you the life, the eternal life, which was with the Father, and is now manifest to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So, in the beginning was God. Remember, before anything was, was God. And what, what was He? He was the eternal God that had no beginning, and no end. And the eternal life that he had, it was only with him. That's what he promised us. And he promised it to humans on the earth. Didn't promise it to our spirits that go to heaven. 
It was never the promise. The promise has always been that he make a man from the dust of the earth. Where did he make man? On the earth. Where did he walk with Adam? On the earth. Where did he meet with Noah? On the earth. Did he always did he take them into the heaven to speak to them whenever he wants to speak to them? No. He would come to earth and give them visions. Where did he dwell with Israel? On the earth. Hallelujah. Isn't that beautiful? Do you know that the temple, the temple where all the sacrifices was, was therefore to offer forgiveness of sins? Forgiveness of sin would basically mean separating you or healing you from the death that came to you. The temple is heaven's hospital. That's what the temple was. The temple was, was heaven's hospital where Dr. Jesus would come and dwell amongst people according to Exodus 34 where he says, this is who I am. I am gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin that will by no means pass by any guilty one. But I will visit the sins of the fathers that are upon the children's children. In other words, I'll visit the curse that came to humanity. I'll visit it. With what? With the mercy that He's been keeping for thousands. I am merciful. I keep mercy. It is it's what I keep. Let's say, this is my mercy. I'm keeping it. For thousands upon thousands. I'm keeping it. And I will not pass by any guilty one. I will not pass by any cursed person. But I will visit them. Because I've brought my heavenly hospital to the earth. To heal the earth from the death that's in the earth. What do you mean God? What he means is, he's emptying the grave. He's taking the rule of death over the earth away. And now he's bringing the rule of heaven, the rule of eternal life, to the earth. Praise God. Praise God. I want to tell you, no political leader can help us. They all need help. Yes. 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 Because as long as what you model, you are not the solution. Because you yourself are subject to death. The only one that can help and solve the true problem of humanity is the one that can address the true problem. Now, I, well, the way I got to this message is, I said, God, you know, I want to understand the, the death, the, the birth, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and the ascension. I want to understand why you do things that way. Because I couldn't understand, and I think sometimes it's good to be honest with God. Yes. Have you ever been honest with God to the point that you feel, I hope this is not blessing you? Because I would say to God, God, if I must use, just use my normal human logic, if somebody, and I remember it happened to me years ago, my wife and I were just married, somebody broke into our house. We were so poor. You know, like... like like the one preacher said, I was so poor that I would go out in the morning at five and I would bark because I couldn't afford my own dog. <laughs> so, <laughs> now we were that poor. No, we weren't. We had a dog. We had our own dog, but it was given. We couldn't afford it. It was just given to us. But anyway, and we, we couldn't afford a holiday. My in-law said, come with us on holiday, we were new to marry, just not even a year, I think. And uh, we came back and they just stripped our house. They pulled everything out of the cupboards, just broke the place. We had nothing. And then already I started to have a, an issue with how forgiveness work. And I thought, okay, now this person, I must just forgive him. Now. But he's not going to confess. Because if I want to want forgiveness, I must confess my sin, then God will forgive me. But this person, if he doesn't confess, I must just forgive. And it would be wrong for me to think that unless he forgives, I can go and punish him. Yeah. 
It would be wrong. And I would say to God, and I would have this question, God, why is your forgiveness along the lines of someone dying and being bodily raised from the dead? Unless, and unless he's raised from the dead, there's no forgiveness of sin. What, what, how does that work? And I realized that God knew what the problem was. The problem is that man is dying. That's the problem. That's why the solution is an empty grave. You know, if you would ask all the psychologists in the world, if you would ask all the universities in the world to come together and all the doctors and say to them, solve the problem that the world has, they will not even know what the problem is. The problem is that we die. That's the problem. Yeah. And from that fear of death, we have to have armies to protect our lives because we don't feel that our lives are secure. From that fear of death, we want to gather as much money into ourselves as possible because we want to prolong our lives. Because when we die and we have to face death, oh Lord, we just want to continue to live and even if it's just my legacy or my name that continues to live, I want to keep it high. I want somewhere at least some monument of me or a plaque of me or my children's children to remember my name and so forth because I want some kind of an eternal life. And as we start to gather these resources, we think of provi providing for ourselves. And we are afraid. And from this fear, we, are, we, we try to gather life unto ourselves. Mm -hmm. But what has Jesus come? What has what God promised? He's promised us eternal life. So that we will not, from the dust's ability, try to gather life unto ourselves, where we destroy ourselves and destroy others. Yeah. So that we can enter the shalom of God. A man of peace is a man that's content. You know, when I got this revelation, and I started to realize this revelation, I remember years ago, at the time when I was still poor, I called one of my uh, evangelist friends, and, and he was a, a big evangelist going through, through the world preaching the gospel to massive, massive crowds of people. And I said to him, my brother, I want to tell you, I became a millionaire. He said, who gave you money? <laughs> I said, no. I realized my life is safe with God. Therefore, I'm now content. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> I'm forever safe with God. Even if I die. Because the threat of poverty is, oh, if you don't have enough money, you're going to die. Birds. Isn't it? That's the threat. Yeah. The threat's always death. Yeah. yeah. And God knows what plagues us. And the Hebrew there, it basically says that when the promise is made towards what true the problem truly is, you'll enter into shalom. But if the promise is not made to what the true problem is, you will not enter into shalom. You know, we've only in the church heard the promise is only made to my spirit to go to heaven. But we sit with a physical earth, physical family, physical house, physical everything. And we kind of feel, well, this is just going to burn up some way, and we just a dirt with this body is just a dirt bag that is sinful. And like the Gnostics, we believe if we can just escape this flesh in one day, oh hallelujah, if I can just return to this point. <laughs> to the point where we get frustrated with ourselves. But when God looks at us, he says, My son, my daughter, whom I love, whom I want to save, whom I have promised before the world began. And he's kept his promise. He's, he, 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 for 4,000 years, he's constructed everything so it will be possible for him to raise the first one from the dead, never to die, which is Jesus. And he then showed to all of us what our Father can do, which is promised to all of us. And he had then appointed that eternal man, Jesus, as the president of the world. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Imagine that. That man is Lord of heaven and earth. Amen. You know what beautiful thing happened in Acts 2? Let me just tell you this. Acts 2, 3, 4. You'll find that it said, Jesus says, listen, you know, waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I am going 
Jesus doesn't say, I'm going away as God. He's just in the domain of the eternal. Which is here. We can simply, we, because we are mortal in our body at the moment, we see what is mortal. He is immortal. Doesn't mean he's not here. He's here. He's with us. Now, the Christ, Jesus, is with us. Physically. We don't see him because we're still in that mortal state. But the spirit of the Christ, which is the spirit of eternal life, we have already received it in our flesh. The spirit came upon all flesh. Do you think God hates flesh if he pours his spirit out on flesh? Do you think God hates the temple if he pours out the spirit in the temple? No, he loves the temple. He wants to be there. He wants to dwell there. He wants, he wants that. Man, almost an hour. My goodness. <laughs> I thought I'd just done the introduction. But anyway. That is how he feels about it. He is right here with us. You know what Acts says? And the Bible says, and they went and they preached the word. What word? The word that the kingdom that was promised, the kingdom of eternal life, has now come to this earth so that the rule of life can now start to bring forth what the rule of life promised in the earth where death ruled. Yes. Didn't Jesus teach us, our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Where must it be hallowed? On earth. Yes. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth, has it is now. Yes. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. That's what we pray. We pray the word. Now, I've been preaching the word. What word? You may be preaching some verses, but are you preaching the word? Are you believing the word? What is the word? What is the gospel? Jesus preached the gospel in Mark 1.14. He went and he said, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What was the gospel? That the rule of heaven has now come to earth. Now the question would be, if God's rule has now come here, what will His rule bring forth? His rule brought forth a man from the grave that can never die. To rule on the earth. You know, when I started to hear this and they tell me, you know, the president said this, and the president said that. I don't care. <laughs> well, I can care in this sense that some people's people might experience some pain or discomfort or whatever. But I am not caring about that anymore as if my life depends on it. <laughs> no. Because what if the whole country tomorrow become communist? Well, whatsoever is bad is temporal and whatsoever is good is eternal in the earth so whatever bad thing you see look at it because you're not going to see it forever whatever good you see you will see it forever hallelujah Praise God. they they went in acts 4 and they were preaching the gospel and the bible said and jesus worked with them and confirmed the word with signs, wonders, and miracles. What word did he confirm? He confirmed the word. There was a God promised us eternal life, and he has now raised a man from the dead that can never die, and that man is the Lord. And through him is promised to each one of you in the day when he manifests himself again that all of you bodily will be see the salvation from death for his ruling over death. And then God confirmed the word of eternal life by taking physical bodies and healing them so that they could see that God has the power to fix the body because the promise is towards the body to make the body undying. <laughs> confirmed His word with signs, wonders and miracles, the word of promise. And that word of promise, the, the kingdom gave us the Christ. And that is hope. For the world. 
And the scripture says in detail that we are now born again from this new and living hope. Now that I have hope, I have a new life. And that hope is not to go to heaven. That hope is for heaven to come to earth. I'm not aiming for heaven. Heaven's aim is the earth. Hallelujah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. You know, I, this, this, this one theologian told this story and said it so beautifully. He said um, he was uh, bishop, bishop of Durham and the um, Durham. And he said they heard the story of the stonemasons that would basically cut the stones for some cathedral. And they would cut these stones for 20 years, but they, they just cut the stones according to the design. And one day they decided, let's take these people from the quarry, which is a hundred miles away, to the cathedral. And they could just see what's happening. And all of a sudden they could see, ah, that thing that I made fits there. I never knew that. Wow, it's beautiful. I see where it fits. The beauty of this gospel is that this message that I preach now, in the resurrection, in this earth, I will see where it's fitted. And nothing that any one of us do, born from the Spirit, is not eternal in this earth. When you walk with that cross, it's not, that, it's not temporal. Maybe the time that you walked have passed away. But that building is forever in the earth. We're not doing things to go to heaven. God is busy doing things in the earth and we are part of the very body. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? It, you know when I sit on an airplane and that seat is killing me, I just feel, well, that's okay. Because what we're doing here is, I'm visiting my son, and I'm going to have the opportunity to preach four or five times here. And this whole action is God, the Christ, working in me. And it is part of what God is doing in the earth forever. It's not something that I do to qualify to go to another place. Yeah. 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 It is what God is doing here because we are, we've already qualified. Hallelujah. It gives me a sense of purpose. Not one pound you've ever given me, born from the, 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 from the Spirit of God in you, has ever been wasted. Mm. We'll see where it fits right here. We are already at the place we will be for that. Jesus will return. The graves will open up. And so we will be. We will meet him in the air. And I just want to tell you that meeting in the air, what it means, it, is, it talks about Roman, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Caesar that would maybe come and visit the town. And then the town would go out to meet him. Yes. Because he's now coming to visit them. So we'll go and meet him at the gates of the city or outside of the city and, and walk with him into the city. So when we meet him in the air, it means we are meeting him in the condition of immortality bodily and we are welcoming him to live with us forevermore. God manifested in the flesh. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Hallelujah. And so we'll be with him forevermore. I end off with this. I said it at the last meeting yesterday. When Jesus rose from the dead, Mary looked into the grave and they saw the stone where he was laid and an angel on the one side and an angel on the other side. What can you think of in the Old Testament that had a platform like this with an angel on the one side and an angel on the other side? The Ark of the Covenant. And what God said from the beginning is, my covenant with humanity is an empty grave. It's the message of eternal life. It's only God. Do you know that empty grave in Jerusalem is an evangelist? It's only God that can make an evangelist out of a grave. Preaching all the time. And the, the open mouth 
which is the open grave, which is God's word, which is God's message, says to you and me, death, death says to all of us, I will never be able to have you. I cannot have you. You are not mine. Because I've been broken. God is such a strong God that He killed death. Hallelujah. Isn't that powerful? So, I trust that you now, when you open your Bible, you go and read the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Let's go.